Hello and welcome to Electric Virgins, a podcast brought to you with Green Flag that puts celebrities into electric cars for the first time and then finds out what they really think of them. I'm Ginny Buckley. And I'm Tom Ford, but not the famous or good one. So Ginny, <laughs> who is our Electric Virgin this episode? Our guest this week is a woman who, um, probably unlike you and me, she's quite happy to rough it. Right. Uh, in fact, she's made a career out of teaching people how to survive in the wild. Okay, what are we defining as survival here? Because I know you quite well. A video shoot when there's only instant coffee is you surviving Awful. out in the wild. Where there's no 4G. Where there's no biscuits. That would be you absolutely <laughs> living life on the edge. No, it's a bit more extreme than that, to be honest, Tom. This is like proper out in the wild, eating the scenery, drinking your own wee kind That's of survival. That's not even a thing. It is, people it, don't do that. Well, we can we can ask her. So how about I get ready to introduce you to a woman who has led hundreds of expeditions, consulted for TV adventure shows across the planet, from Africa to the Arctic. She's a world-renowned expert on survival, and I think we can add stunt driver to that list as well. Please welcome survivalist and best-selling author, the clearly indestructible, and she still has a smile on her face, Megan Hyde. <laughs> Hey, Meg. Hi. <laughs> Is it true about the wee? <laughs> Do you really drink your That's own wee? It's not a thing. <laughs> you said it's not a thing. <laughs> uh, well, I think by the time you got to the point that you're that dehydrated that you'd actually be considering drinking your own urine, your body isn't actually producing that much, if anything. Um, so you'd have to be planning ahead and know that you're getting into that situation to actually get into that stage. But I do hear that there are people out there that do drink their own urine. No, yeah, it's not. No, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Do you know one of the best things, right? I, I was doing a little bit of cyber stalking of you and the, not, not like, shh. Be worried, Meg. And the, the best thing is that the first thing that comes up when you cyber stalk you is that you're an adventurer. What careers advisor did you go to to figure out that you were going to be, <laughs> that you're going to just be an adventurer? What, how did you get into what you're doing? Because you're doing tons of stuff, aren't you? Yeah, you yeah, know, it was quite by um, quite by chance, really, I suppose, that uh, my career went this way. A um, lot of family holidays out into the mountains. My dad was a geologist, so I spent a lot of time going and looking at rocks. Ah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, close and personal with like fossils and things. Uh, so it kind of, yeah, it kind of started from, from there, really, and did a lot of adventurous training through the military cadets, did a lot of mountain biking and running and stuff for myself. And I had no idea there was a career in, in, in adventure. Uh, well, <laughs> rubbing sticks together and, and things. Yeah. It's like Indiana Jones comes, comes back to haunt us. Oh, dear. And, and cars. Let's talk about cars. Have they played um, a big part in your career? Yeah. So again, kind of by chance, really, I got into four by four driving. I was running like survival courses and we teamed up with mm. Land Rover Experience and they were teaching, you know, part of the overland expedition side of things was to teach people how to offer a drive. Uh, and I loved it. And it was something I'd always wanted to do. So I started doing that and then I started guiding for an off-road driving company in the Lake District, guiding the green lanes and causing havoc. <laughs> Yeah, and then from then, when I started doing the TV work, the kind of instructional qualifications that I'd got and the guiding qualification stuff, I ended up doing um, four by four stunt driving. Oh, okay. Yeah, which was awesome. Um, I really, I've really loved that. So at one point, like we held the record for getting a four by four to the highest point in, <gasps> in the UK. Or I want to do that again. Can we do yeah. that again <laughs> in an EV? Can you both do it? I've got, I can get an electric EV four by four. An electric, an electric EV. An electric EV. Is that a thing? <laughs> that was mega. Where was that? That was in Mexico um, oh. on um, Pico de Rosalba, like oh. one of the volcanoes down there. It was it was epic. Um, yeah, I'm totally up for doing that again. Oh, mate, <laughs> don't so encourage you, him. You pick Honestly. the least dynamic thing to learn to ha how to drive, like 4 by 4s being the least dynamic. Listen, mate, he needs no encouraging <laughs> oh, we'll with, these that with these crazy ideas. I know before I know it, you two are going to be on top of a mountain. In a pair of EVs, and, and I'll that tell terrifies you what, me. We will get some jacks and make it six inches higher than whatever you managed before, just to get the record. <laughs> we will win. Anyway, anyway, now let's just stick them with electric cars. I think we should probably reveal the car that we gave you for the week. So you are perfectly happy living off grid, aren't you? You're quite cool about that. You don't need creature comforts in life. 
<laughs> I don't. And it's, it's a great feeling, but it's, I do like them well, for sure from time to time. The car we chose for you is the Hyundai Ionic 5. So it's got all-wheel drive so you can head off into the unknown. It's also got there something really clever that we love, which is called a V2L system. It basically means that you can use the car's battery as a, a power source. Think of it as a mobile generator. So if you need to pump up your air mattress or you want to power a television as you watch Love Island at the top of the mountain or whatever it is you want to watch, you can do it regardless of where you were. We thought that suited you very much. So let's just hear uh, what your first impressions were when you saw the car. So I'm looking at the car at the moment and it is just beautiful. <laughs> it's like a spaceship's just arrived on my driveway. <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. It's this matte black. Uh, the whole thing just looks super sexy. I haven't really looked that hard at electric cars. I don't know, in my head, I kind of just think that they're like this little hairdryer thing that's driving around with very little power and um, yeah, not particularly attractive, very unsexy, but this completely blows that image of electric cars out of the water. Oh, you flicked every switch I've got then. Not very powerful and a bit like a hairdryer. <laughs> <laughs> well done for just insulting everything, I think. <laughs> we must be into the 80s, though, because Ionic 5s are quite, they're quite retro looking weirdly, aren't they? It is, but it was just, it's so beautiful though. It was so much more chunky and heavy sex. I, I, I drive a pickup truck um, and I've always driven like larger vehicles. Of course you do. Um, yeah, so, so when, when you guys said that you're going to send me a car to try out, I just thought I was going to get this tiny little thing and like <laughs> drive They're it around. Big. But actually it was like big. And, yeah, but it was great. It was so nice because it was just so intuitive getting into it and, and, and driving it. And like, I've, I live in Snowdonia, so I've been like driving it around on the, the lanes up here and uh, going climbing in it and, and stuff. And I mean, how just, is that on awesome. the lanes though? Because it's quite wide. It's same, same sort of width as, a, width as a Range Rover. They're quite big. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm used to driving big vehicles, um, so the, the size of it isn't an issue at all. What caught me out a few times is it obviously reads, I mean, you, you guys have to, like, fill me in on the technology of it, but obviously reads, like, the central line, and the net, the yeah. lanes here are so narrow, and the central line isn't actually, like, <laughs> you Lane have to drive assist. over the side of it, and it kept pulling me back in and, like, throwing me towards the walls and the sheep and stuff. So so I hate that system. You that can, you can switch those off. systems off. They are very hit and miss. They're really useful on motorway driving. Yeah. That's where they really come into mm. their own, but I do agree on, uh, on little country roads, they're not ideal. There is a way to switch them off, but you're probably like me and you just it's a long didn't worry press. about looking for that. I actually know that off by heart. It's a long press of the little icon that has two little lines on it. You know you that press, by you heart. You press it for three seconds and it all goes off. Because once I was trying to overtake a cyclist and it tried to make me knock the cyclist off. So oh, yes, since it's then, scary, isn't it, when it does that the first time? Won't have it <laughs> too much. Oh, dear me. Um, well, listen, let's have a listen to you going for a drive through the mountains, see what you made of it all. Just been for a drive, um, get it going out to the coast to my grandmother, which is about 45 minutes from me. I just drive straight through the mountains, through through a mixture of narrow and windy uh, lanes with big walls on the sides and like sheep everywhere. And um, just blows my mind that uh, an electric car has got so much power. It's like I put my foot down and wow, it's off. Because like I, you know, I've grown up driving these little these little country roads, and I'm used to driving big vehicles like vans <laughs> and pickup trucks um, and all sorts of four by fours. So so <laughs> quite competent at navigating these uh, these little windy roads. It's like whenever anyone gets an electric car, they always go, "Oh, it's really fast." Isn't it? It's really fast. <laughs> were, you, were you not prepared for that, Meg? Because you said earlier, actually, that you're, you know, you kind of thought of them almost a bit like hair dryers on wheels. Did it shock you? Yeah, no, it really did. It really did. Like the whole, the whole vibe of the car and um, everything. I guess like around me in Snowdonia, it's not, don't really see many electric cars <laughs> and things. <laughs> yeah. It's mostly, you know, you see a lot of like Land Rovers and like little Practical runarounds and stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, apart from the testers, I haven't seen any. It's that thing of, you know, when you got in it and it was quiet and yet fast, what did it make you think? What was that initial impression? Woo! 
Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's like because I'm I just literally just drive down my road and there's like the valley like um that drives past like Trevon and the Glitters. It's like right that's my yeah. that's my nearest valley. It's like you get in there and it's like you just put your foot down and fly through the mountains. And it's got these screens in front of you as well. And it just, yeah, you just feel like you're flying. It was like the most amazing feeling. It's nice being in the countryside with it all quiet. I, I always think this. It's like they should make electric convertibles more yeah, because they'd be really quiet. It's a really good and point. And you'd be out though. in the air. Yeah, the peacefulness of driving one is it com- is it's a bit of a contrast sometimes to that speed that you get, isn't it? Because you do have all that speed, but also it's just so relaxing because it's so quiet. Mm, they are quite chilled. Okay. Now, you, you're talking, so you live in Snowdonia, um, as you said. Not many electric cars around there. Beautiful part of the world, though. Very, very beautiful. And, of course, for this, we didn't get you a charger fitted at home. You know, if you were going to go out and buy an electric car, cheap. you would have a charger. Not cheap. It just took a long time <laughs> you to have organize. Made a, you should have made Ginny put you a charger in. Honestly. I think that's the only way we could have done this properly. <laughs> but I think it's an interesting challenge because we know that uh, rural areas in the UK are a danger of getting left behind, really, when it comes to electric vehicle charging. The infrastructure isn't there. So there are more, for example, I've got a good stat for you. There are more charging points currently, public charging points in Westminster than there are in the whole of Cumbria. So that just gives you an idea of just, you know, what it's like for charging in rural areas. But we did arm you with all the information that you needed to find a charger. So let's just listen to how you got on. I've downloaded the app that was recommended with the car. Um, the only thing I can see on that which might be a bit of an issue is that the app, it seems like, I guess, I don't know how it works, but it seems like when maybe when people fill up, you have the choice of whether you update, whether it's free or not. But it seems to be like the last time that those charging stations were updated as to whether they're available or not was like, it was a couple of weeks ago. So um, I've got like 30% left on the car and I'm kind of like need to be filling it up really. Filling up? Is that the right term? Charging it? Putting some electricity into it. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit worried, actually, because I got to go home <laughs> tonight and I've got, obviously there's no charging points in the mountains. Yeah, you, you downloaded the app um, and you found that it, it, it didn't necessarily tell you whether the points were clear or not. And when you got there to charge, what happened? <laughs> um, when I got there to charge, um, all the points were, were full. So... Yeah, I had a bit of a moment of like, well, what do I do? Like, if you call out like the rescue, how do they like get you going again? It's not like they can put a jerry can of fuel into the car. And <laughs> well, actually, they can. They if can. You, yeah, if you <laughs> get, if way. you have, if one of the, if an electric car stops, it just stops. It will go into like a tortoise mode for a bit. Recovery services will just bring essentially a portable battery, plug your car in and get you going again, or they put it on the back of a truck. I have to just add a caveat to that is it is a very, very tiny amount of range. Oh, it's to get you to another charger. But I, you, you had 30%. That's basically thousands and thousands of miles yeah. of range. Ginny will go down to 2% and oh, the car will be <laughs> falling over and gasping. You had tons of range. But I suppose where you are, you haven't got the access to big chargers, have you? No, and it was surprising actually how fast the, the charge was going down on it just from i don't know if it's like driving through the mountains like the ups and the downs and like i guess con- not a constant speed it's too much speed um, it's aggressive driving yeah, it was, it was really aggressive driving does that megan <laughs> yeah. the thing is if you had home charging every time you went home you'd just plug your car in you kind of get you get muscle memory you plug it back in and then every time you get up again it's full so it does when you get home charging it's fine it's like you find that when you have an electric car you don't end up using public charging all that much really you don't but we've still got to remember a third of the uk maybe less in some rural areas but they don't have access to off street parking so for a lot of people they will be in the position that meg was in which is relying on finding those chargers you didn't give up on trying to charge did you because those points were all full yeah, I, well, I hung around for a while in the car park, <laughs> waiting like for somebody to... Like a weirdo. That <laughs> yeah, really sat, sat in your car. Loitering, <laughs> loitering in the car park and like, yeah, no, yeah, just people were just obviously plugged in, gone for a coffee or something. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I eventually gave up oh, <laughs> and okay. uh, carried on with, with what I was doing. Um, and then, yeah, I drove back to near where I live where there's another charging point and plugged in there. And then I realised that it's not like there aren't there don't seem to be any fast charging points around and it was going to take hours and hours just to yeah. get me enough <laughs> to get any. 
Let's have a listen to that clip, the clip that where you, um, you had given up on chant, you weren't giving up and you'd found somewhere else. Let's listen to that one. I'm now back over near where I live, at my nearest charging station. And again, there aren't really any charging points in Bangor. Um, so I'm just, I'm sitting here and I've just plugged in the car um, and it's popped out and up and told me that it's going to take eight hours to, to charge. Ah! <laughs> Do you know that disappointment is all too familiar when you don't really know how big the charger is and you don't know about EVs and you plug it and you go, oh, 27 hours. And that that's one of the really hard things to get your head around, isn't it? That there are different charging speeds um, depending on what rate the power is coming out. Yeah. Did you Were you prepared for that? Did you have any idea about that? No. No, no, I had, I had no idea. Like I, I might just suppose naively, I just thought that all charging units were equal and then you'd plug it in and it would be like, you know, like an hour and a half or something. Oh, and I, no. I had thought like, how do you charge? Cause it takes, you know, how long it takes to charge up an iPhone. I was like, well, surely it's going to take a lot longer to charge a car up. <laughs> Get really, really hot. <laughs> just because you... yeah, yeah. So the, the thing with that Ionic 5 that you had, it has this thing called 800 volt architecture, which sounds, it's just some words, but if you put that on a really, really big charger, like on the motorways, that's 350 kilowatt, that'll do 60 miles every four minutes. Whoa. So I've, got, I've had them on road trips when I've just planned going to those really big chargers, and then I'll put 180 miles in it in sort of 12 minutes, and then you're gone again. But I always think that somehow my skin's going to go crispy if I stand next to the car when it's doing that. <laughs> but I, I think that's the, the really the difficult thing is that we've got all these new habits to learn, haven't we, Meg? Yeah, it's just not as, as simple now as going up and filling up your car with petrol or diesel. We've got to rethink things with electric. Um, and you certainly can't plug in at home because you tried to do that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, did you? <laughs> I, love you. I love the fact you tried to plug this massive car in at home. Well, you can. <laughs> well, you can. Yeah, but it just take you, you seven can. days to get any charge. How, how long did it say it was going to take to charge? Like 60 hours. Wow. <laughs> oh, never mind. I can't plug it in at Tesco. I'll go and plug it in at home. And I say, like, oh. So okay. it's going to be three days before you can go yeah. anywhere. <laughs> uh, but again, I think, Meg, it's just, it's just coming back to, isn't it, that, you know, we need to almost get you a home charger fitted and then send you the car again. And then you can just see that contrast. I was thinking like about the planning side of it because you know I, re I remember driving before like you know GPSs were standard in every car and having to write down on all the paper like you know <laughs> yeah. the directions and actually really plan where you're going yeah and also and it was it was so mindful as well in the fact that you knew where you were going and you were very aware of everything around you whereas I've got like quite lazy at driving I don't I put my GPS on I don't really look at where I'm going I wouldn't know how to get back again yes all of those things I just thought with Driving the electric car, because I was aware of these things, I was so much more aware of what was around me. And you that was actually, that was a really nice realisation. Yeah. Now, listen, uh, you have been um, electrified for a while there for the first time. So I think we reckon you must be something um, of an expert now. So we're going to test your knowledge. Is, is that unfair. all right? It's so unfair. As I'm sure you know, Meg, together with Green Flag, we have a word of the day. Word of the day. Oh, he's developed a really word awful thing, June. Stop it. We have a word of the day. Don't do it again. Which appears on our site every morning. So to see um, how much you've been paying attention. We're going to give you a description of a common electric car term, which you won't know. And then all you have to do is choose the correct answer. It's like a terrible quiz. <laughs> right, drum roll, please. Hit me. <laughs> Megan Hine, which of the following is a term for the feeling you get, this is quite apt, when you don't think you have enough battery to get you to somewhere to charge? Is it A? Plug panic. Is it B? Charge concern. Is it C? Range anxiety. I'm going with what? I'm going to go with the range anxiety because that's definitely what I was feeling. <laughs> But is that right? It is yeah, right. But I think, no although I think to be honest, you had all three. You had charger concern, plug panic and range anxiety. All I rolled into one. You definitely had all of those, <laughs> yeah. You do get a gold star, though, for picking the one thing that's been in the news for the past five years. Well done. <laughs> Look, um, we said at the top that one of the reasons that we thought the Ionic would be an interesting car for you is because it's got this thing called the V2L, which is basically just this ability um, to become a mobile generator. You can literally plug things into the car. 
and then you get you get power from the traction battery, power, not right. from the little battery. When, when when we had a week of power cuts a while ago, I had an Ionic Five. Oh, did he power the house? I didn't power the house. I made my son go in the car. He's, he, all the power had gone. His laptop had gone down. They were homeschooling, and I made him go into the car and do his homework and, and join the school lessons. By plugging into the Ionic, he was so cross with me. If I was a kid, I'd hate you. But, but I know it was very, very mean parenting. But actually, it worked really well. But I did, you know, you can, you could. I paired a little fridge from it and kept some milk cold in it. So it's just a really, actually, brilliant thing to do. The only thing I've ever been interested in that is because you can boil a kettle. Well, I think that's probably something you relate to, Meg. So do, is that kind of thing? Is that something that you think could be useful for you on expeditions? If I'm like kind of guiding, I suppose, or waiting for a group, um, I need some extra power, like on a laptop or, you know, a kettle or um, whatever. It's, it was actually quite nice having that rather than having to get out the stove um, and boil up water and make a coffee. You just plug a little kettle into the into the back. Which is... Do you know one thing I wanted to ask you about as well? What do you think about electric cars going off road? Because you've got all of that power. You don't have to rev an engine. It's quiet. Do you think it'd work? I would love to try it. I was going to, this is something I wanted to ask you guys about. Like, like how far along is that technology? Because I'd love to try that. The idea of, of that just, it would just be incredible. But how does it work with like the power and the, <laughs> like the output and, and things of like that? It works so well. You can hear which wheel's got traction because there's no engine noise. Oh, so you can figure yeah. out how to tread really lightly when you're off road. Okay. But I think yeah. we need to cook up something where <laughs> I I know I'm but, not just but I just, I just mean, want to go <laughs> I want to go with Megan and she can show but, me how to drive off road. But, but just do some context for people that are listening about why what is it about electric cars that make them so suitable for off road because they do work really well, don't they? Uh, loads of torque. What is torque? When you rev a car, you get power, um, which is kind of noisy power. Torque is the stuff that pushes you back in your seat. So torque is the stuff that makes you go faster, really, and it's acceleration. But if you get an electric car, it doesn't need rev, so you don't need to rev an engine. And Megan will be familiar with off-road. If you've got a massively revving engine, it's, it's a bit annoying, really. But also with electric cars, you can make each wheel do exactly what you want it to. So they're infinitely configurable. And it makes them really good at kind of crawling and being very, very slow, but with loads of torque and loads of power going up, up hills and things. And that would be really interesting to give you one. I had, a, I had a Mercedes on portal axles that was electric. And that's a big wow. set of axles, which means it can go over different things. Yeah. Giving you that would be really interesting to see what you thought. How does it sound, Meg? Do you reckon you could, would you be quite tempted to really take one out somewhere pretty wild? Yeah, no, definitely. Like, it's like my brain's like whirring of like where <laughs> I could take it, where test it out and stuff. I hadn't even thought about the fact that, yeah, because it's so quiet, you'd actually be able to hear what the yeah. the wheels are doing. And yeah, like, because when you're four by four driving, it's like, as you say, it's so slow. And it's like the vehicle just becomes like an extension of yeah. yourself. And if you've got, if your senses, like your hearing and your things can actually be more a part of that. It would, yeah, it'd be really intriguing to see it really how works. it compares. And the weird thing is yeah. you creep up on the wildlife. So I've been off-roading before. I was in America and oh, I crept yeah. up and there was a bobcat in the trail and we didn't scare it Wow! because, you, yeah. because you're quiet. But it, then you get to the top and realise you haven't got much charge left and then the range anxiety <laughs> yeah. really kicks in because, <laughs> you, you know, you're 100 yeah, miles would, away yeah. from anything. <laughs> I guess the interesting thing um, to, to ask you really is that you need... Very, you know, you need rough, tough vehicles. You're out, as you say, you're a survivalist. Can you see a point where electric would work in those environments? You know, where you're perhaps powering from solar panels? Because obviously, you know, there's so much fantastic technology around that allows you to, you know, harness solar. There's a but you can feed that straight into car batteries. You know, if you fast forward, can you see that point in your life where you're relying fully on electric for your expeditions? I'd love to. I'd love to get to that that point. A lot of the trips and expeditions I do are very remote, um, where you know the technology would be well well behind. But if there was if there was methods of portable power supplies, um, harnessing wind, sun, any like of these energies. Um, then I could definitely see a place for it. Um, and it would actually, you know, with the movement towards kind of protecting the environment and, you know, I'm very, very aware of like the impact that the expeditions have, the film work that I do has on the environment. 
Uh, and it would just be amazing to be able to still go to these places and have kind of less guilt about, about visiting them. On my own expeditions, I always try to work with indigenous peoples, local peoples, trying to support local economies and things. But there always is that impact. You've flown there, you know, you've bought, particularly with outdoor kit and equipment, you know, petrochemicals, all of this sort of stuff has a huge impact. You know, it's one of the uh, most destructive parts of, you know, going adventuring is actually the kit and equipment Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the, the manufacturing process behind that. So anything to be able to kind of offset that and start making people more aware as well. And like you said, that immersive experience into the wilderness, if you can see more wildlife and you know, scare the wildlife less and things, even like kind of little things like that has such a huge impact on, you know, on the planet. And you've been to, you know, so many remote places. Um, have you seen the impact of climate change on some of your adventures? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so very, very much so. And I've been seeing it for, you know, for over a decade now on these trips. Uh, I tend to work in quite remote and extreme places and it's really in those areas well to start with I was really seeing it in those areas like you know glaciers retreating much faster um, plants growing in the desert that have never been seen before in these areas Um, wow so are the seasons kind of blurring a little bit more yeah, very much so. Um, see, really kind of seeing that, like, you know, in jungle regions where, like, the fruiting seasons have become mm. a bit sporadic. You know, we look at, like, uh, the Everest climbing season. That's become much more unpredictable, um, much shorter and kind of all over the place. Um, so it's, it's definitely, definitely changing. I mean, even in the UK now, we're really seeing that, you know, the storms over the winter and, and things were just so random and unpredictable. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated. I don't, you know, I don't know enough about uh, our impact as humans, whether it's us, whether it's a natural cycle or whether it's a combination of it, but it's whatever it is, it's definitely happening. So, you know, just a few degrees shift in temperature and, and things is going to have a dramatic impact, a drastic impact on, um, on humanity uh, moving forwards. Uh, but this is where I think, you know, like technology and stuff, we have these amazing brains working on, you know, on solutions. We just need to come together more and mm-hmm. actually bring those solutions together rather than trying to work against each other, which is what seems to be like a human trait. <laughs> well, with all that in mind, it's almost time to find out if we have convinced Megan to go electric. But before we put you on the spot, just a reminder that our podcast is brought to you in association with the Green Flag. And do remember, the great thing about Green Flag is that if you're unlucky enough to break down or get a puncture, they will spend a specialist from your closest garage to come and give you a hand. And they'll do that day or night, won't they? They don't clock off at 5.30. They'll do that day or night, Tom. Right, we're going back to your week with the Ionic 5. And as we've established, you're an expert on surviving when the going gets tough. But I'm worried that by giving you a car with things like relaxation seats and heated steering wheels that you've gone soft, <laughs> would you, Megan Hine, adventurer, fan of things it's off-road... My, I'm doing a drum roll. ...consider going electric for your next car? Can I stop and put a caveat in? If we gave you a fast-charging unit at home... <laughs> <laughs> Yes or no? Come on. 100%, 100% yes. Wow. As long as it can go off-road as well. Wow. As long as I can have, like, two. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I thought the charging thing might just wind you up yeah, a bit. But with, well, if I've got the home charging points. Because, like, so, like, well, survival is all about, like, conservation of energy and, and efficiency. Um, so, yeah, definitely. If there was a home charging point, then Yes. Definitely. I think because it's also like, I quite like living on the edge as well. So it's like that kind of like excitement of like, am I going to get home? Or like, what am I going to do? There's no signal in the mountains if this thing runs out of of power. So it's actually like, that was actually kind of quite exciting. It kind of fed into like the adventurous spirits. Just by the side of the road though. You know, it's just, it's not a really pretty place to be. Well, I have a feeling we're going to have to do um, a return visit with you, Meg. Um, and I think it might be quite extreme from the conversations that oh I hear you having. Oh, my God, I've got about having. four different trips I need to do. Oh, no. Well, that seems a perfect point to end this week's podcast. Meg, thank you for breaking your electric car virginity. Still weird. With electrifying.com. <laughs> for selflessly giving up your time to drive one of the best electric cars in the world. You've been a real sport. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved driving the car and <laughs> the little adventures that we've had together. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Bye. 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 
That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed hearing about Meg's first time, and let's face it, we never forget our oh first God, time. Oh, God, so weird. <laughs> Please do like, subscribe and share so you can spread the word. And if you want to know more about electric cars, we've got everything you need to know about making the switch over at electrifying.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.